Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on what ISCB is now offering for pupils in year seven and eight, including the new CE specifications and the IPQ. Uh, having not been able to attend any conferences this year, we weren't able to hold our own conference. It is a real pleasure to be engaging with several hundred teachers who signed up for these sessions. We hope that you find this introductory session helpful and we look forward to seeing you at other events in the coming months. Please tell us what you think of this session so we can build your feedback in as we plan other events uh, for further professional development. For me personally, it's really exciting uh, to see the launch of these specifications. When I became ISCB chair in October 2018, I committed to a full consultation uh, on the future of CE and I was delighted by the number of teachers from senior and prep schools who wanted to contribute. In what seems now like the far off pre-pandemic days, it would have been unheard of for such a consultation process to take place without meeting face to face. And so we held a series of meetings to discuss CE as a whole and individual subjects and two key elements underpinned discussions. First, we wanted to address the view that CE was in some way outmoded and focused too much on imparting a huge body of knowledge. Second, we wanted to address the perception that it lent itself to rote teaching. This drew us into focusing squarely on what CE is for. So while retaining a function as an entrance examination, its value lies in providing an opportunity for prep schools to acknowledge what pupils have achieved in year seven and eight, and allowing senior schools to know what pupils arriving at the beginning of year nine know and understand and can do. And as such, it can provide the backdrop for exciting teaching and fulfilling learning. To ensure this, we began to focus on what we initially called learner profiles. Uh, what sort of learners would pupils who had followed the CE specifications actually be? We were perhaps a bit idealistic about this and at times rather wordy, um, but a clear consensus emerged. And this showed us what so many teachers see as the value of CE. Over time, these have been refined and condensed, but those of you who were involved in the consultation will recognise the things that we talked about, especially the shorthand of less is more, uh, less focus on what pupils know and more on what they can do with what they know. It's not about knowledge versus skills, but how acquiring knowledge enables the development of skills. And so now we have on the front of all of the specifications, a clear indication of what CE is all about. First of all, CE equips pupils not only for the next stage of their education, but for lifelong learning. Many of you will have heard me say before that key stage three in general and years seven and eight in particular are the last bastion of independence in the curriculum between uh, the tyranny of key stage two tests and often three year courses leading to GCSEs. Whatever is going to happen to GCSEs in the coming years, CE will assist in developing pupils who enjoy reading and are able to articulate clearly orally and in writing and then ce is based on a secure foundation of subject knowledge concepts and skills so while we believe in the importance of examinations of assessment of subjects and of knowledge we want these to underpin understanding of wide-ranging concepts and skills. This helps pupils understand how subjects connect with each other and to demonstrate cultural awareness and empathy, developing an understanding of their own place in the world. Thirdly, CE encourages pupils 
to apply what they know to new situations. Applying knowledge and developing skills are essential to growing in confidence and flexibility as learners. Our consultation wanted to make explicit the expectation that pupils should have the confidence to weigh up evidence and make up their own minds and the resilience to learn from their mistakes. And finally, CE develops enthusiastic learners who are open to new ideas and experiences, who are curious, questioning, and keen to experiment. The teachers we spoke to were proud subject specialists whose motivation was to nurture enthusiasm and open-mindedness. Our specifications should encourage pupils to have the skills to work independently and collaboratively. So in this way, CE is about more than the assessment at the end. In getting to the point where a pupil can perform at their best in these examinations, they will develop as learners and thus will CE acknowledge what they have achieved and what they know, understand and can do. But we felt something was missing, something which would allow pupils to apply all this to an area of knowledge not defined by any specification, but generated by their own interests. This is what motivated us to develop an age appropriate version of the extended project qualification, which we have come to call the ISEB project qualification or IPQ. We see this as a real opportunity for exciting learning through real research. The IPQ can be undertaken in subject timetable or homework time or in off table timetable time, like after examinations in the summer term of year seven or after CE itself, uh, or of course, as a co curricular activity. It allows pupils to ask a question that interests them, to research the answer, to amend the question in the light of the research to reach conclusions and to present those in whatever form they wish, be it an essay, an artifact, a podcast, a PowerPoint presentation, a performance or whatever. Crucially, it's the entire process which is assessed and the output is only one part of that. So we think that CE plus IPQ make for an exciting and fulfilling learning experience for pupils and allow for exciting and fulfilling teaching. I think that's probably quite enough about the origins and the thought processes behind it all, the why, the whence and the wherefore. Uh, but it's with great pleasure that I hand over now to our new CEO, Julia Martin, to say more about the how how the specifications will bring all of this to life. Julia, thank you. Thank you, Darrell. So as Britain's oldest school exam dating back to about 1904, CE has been an established rite of passage for generations. Both Darrell and I remember ours well, and my own children are currently experiencing that heady balance of nerves with that later feeling of achievement and anticipation about the next stage of their education and their lives. Transitions are really important milestone for young learners and recognising this, our aim is to balance that heritage with innovation. And the new specifications have been to develop, have been, sorry, developed to retain that underpinning subject knowledge that CE is renowned for alongside the development of key academic skills. So the new specifications are to encourage teaching and learning that makes the examination a natural culmination of two years study and develops learners that can apply what they know and can do to unfamiliar questions in the assessment with a sense of confidence in their ability and end in one stage of education thoroughly equipped for the next. Of course, CE is best expressed by our subject experts. And so I hand you over to Abigail, sorry, Abigail Farr, um, to talk to us about the exciting English specification, one of our core specifications for common entrance. 
Thank you very much, Julia, and welcome everyone to the webinar this evening. After a busy day at school, I appreciate your time. I hope that I can reassure you over the next half an hour or so of the sound principles at the heart of our new English specification, um, and also walk you through the new design of the assessment papers. Um, so I'm ready to go and hoping that they Fantastic. And the next one. The next slide. Very good. OK, um, so um, the principles, there are three tenets to our new specification in English. Um, and I think that you will agree wholeheartedly with all of them. Um, first of all, we want our pupils to thoroughly enjoy reading and to see reading as, um, as something that engages them and is a valuable use of their time. We also want them to be able to read for depth of understanding and to be able to apply those reading skills to different situations in life. So it's not just about reading texts, it's about reading people and reading situations. Um, we also want them to be able to master certain skills, including writing and reading skills, more of those in a moment. Um, but also learning how to learn with each other. And I think that's so important going into the middle of the 21st century now. We don't know what jobs our students will be required to perform or wanting to perform in 20, 30 years time. But we know that they're going to have to work together. They're going to have to work collaboratively um, and they're going to have to think on their feet. And the best starting point for that is in the classroom, in class discussions where they have to listen to each other and to bounce ideas off each other. OK, so um, moving on to my next slide then. Realistically or logistically, um, the specification as we are able to assess it um, falls into two categories, the reading and the writing. We'd love to be able to assess speaking as well and collaboration, but that's something that we hope this specification will set up for you or enable you, empower you um, to facilitate in the classroom. Um, in terms of reading, we would like pupils to be able to enjoy a wide range of texts, to be able to expand the sort of text that they feel comfortable reading, um, so everything from genre fiction through to classics, through to drama and poetry, non-fiction texts, for them to feel empowered to read literature of all different forms and non-fiction writing of all different forms. Um, as I said before, we want them to be able to read the depth of understanding. And when they are scrutinizing the text that they read, we want them to be able to appreciate the, the writer's craft um, and also to be able to develop that in their own writing as well. Um, and as you will know, as subject specialists, the best way of learning how to articulate your ideas in writing is first of all, to be able to articulate them in talk. Um, so we're hoping that this specification will give children opportunities to organize their ideas, organize their responses to literature, um, and to prioritize them and evaluate in talk, first of all, um, and then in, in the written form. And now it's time for my next slide. Breaking that down a little further, um, you'll see on the slide in front of you the sorts of things that we want to zoom in on um, in terms of what that means in application. So, as I said before, feeling confident responding to text in different forms, being able to select information precisely and as required as the situation demands, um, understanding literal meanings. I think that's so important. I think often I find when I'm teaching that my students jump to a kind of instinctive response, which can be very powerful, but actually I want to train them to make an evidence-based reading in the first instance, to work out the literal meanings, and then from there to infer more deeply. So being able to select information, read for literal meaning, 
synthesize their understanding, um, and then to apply meanings in context to infer more deeply, um, to evaluate the effect of a text, and finally, and this is something a little bit new for our new specification, it's certainly a move forward from the old specification, we would like them to begin to learn how to structure a critical argument in prose. Moving on. In writing, um, I'm sure that you will be fully on board with these skills as well, and um, these things that we want our pupils to be able to um, achieve and to develop um, in writing. Um, so first of all, developing their own voice. Yes, appreciating other writers' craft, but in so doing, applying those skills to their own writing and through that, developing their own personal voice. Um, confidence and accuracy in spelling, punctuation and grammar. It's really important that they should become clear communicators and that by the time they come into their senior schools in year nine, they should be able to communicate clearly and accurately and feel confident in doing so. Um, adapting their writing to purpose and to audience. Um, and as mentioned before, learning how to structure a critical response and develop a critical response, first of all in speech and then in prose. Um, and we hope that by doing that in speech, first of all, that will open up opportunities for collaborative learning and discussion in class. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, in, in, in terms of practical application, how do we want them to be able to write? Well, in a full range of styles, excuse me for the typo there, um, narrative, descriptive, informative, discursive and persuasive writing. And we want them to be exposed to all those different forms of writing because it empowers them to be able to exercise their voice and their opinions and their creativity and their imagination in different ways. All those different forms of writing require different structural forms different styles and different registers. Um, in terms of addressing a specification or a, rather an exam question, learning how to answer the prompt, to read the question and to respond precisely to it. We want them to learn those skills of planning their work, organizing it and structuring it, thinking about it before they write so that it can become deliberately crafted and once again, we want them to become confident communicators in terms of spelling, punctuation, and grammar. Next slide. Now, whereas it's relatively straightforward for us to assess um, close reading skills in the moment with an unseen text, and we can assess writing skills in the moment as well by assessing the quality of a student's written response to a text, we can't assess the wonderful, adventurous, wide ranging, wider reading that we hope the specification will inspire um, in the classroom in years seven and eight. And so for this reason, um, I've created something uh, called the reading certificate, which I hope schools will adopt as an opportunity to present to secondary schools, first of all, the wider reading that their students have enjoyed, um, but secondly, their imaginative engagement with that wider reading. Um, so if I can just flip onto the next slide. What I suggest is that over years seven and eight, or perhaps in year seven and again in years eight, in year eight, um, each pupil with the support of their teacher chooses um, a, a portfolio of reading choices um, that they decide they will progress with throughout the year, which might change and adapt as they, as they progress, including a completely free choice, a fantasy or science fiction novel, a detective novel, a text from another culture, because we want them to look at other cultural perspectives apart from their own, as well as their own, um, an autobiography, a non-fiction book, and a classic. 
Um, and after much consideration with my team and with the, um, the consultation bodies, the bodies with whom we consulted, um, we've come up with those um, categories because we hope that it gives you and your pupils that perfect combination of freedom of choice, but also encouraging to, them to explore different genres and different forms. Um, and so for each of those categories, they'll select a book, they'll enjoy reading it, and then they'll negotiate with you a creative response that they might make. And to give you some examples of those um, which my students have completed, um, one of my pupils recently created a diorama in a shoebox of Lord of the Flies, where he created a little sort of stage set in the shoebox with quotations from the novel, um, which gave a sort of physical 3D representation of what he believed that book was all about, his imaginative representation of it. Um, other students, um, one, one of my pupils read uh, Tony Blair's autobiography and um, enjoyed creating an, uh, a video of himself as Tony Blair being interviewed by also himself as the interviewer. He sort of spliced the, inter um, the videos together. Um, so he, he staged an interview of, of Tony Blair and recorded it as a little film clip. Um, so there's two examples. Other pupils have done um, imaginative retellings, um, designed posters, um, written poems, missing scenes from a play, all sorts of different things that they can do. And I've really encouraged them to be as imaginative as possible in the ways that they choose to respond to their reading. Um, I, I know that as a, a secondary school teacher, um, I was head of English at Westminster School, I'm now an assistant head at Westminster School, um, that when your pupils come from prep school with examples of their work, it's really delightful to see what they've achieved and also provides a really strong foundation for progression from there. It's a really happy way of getting to know them. Thank you. Next slide. OK, so those are the principles of the new specification. Um, but essentially, um, what most pupils perhaps see of CE is the end of end of term assessment, the examination papers. Um, and certainly much of my job comprises working with my setting team, who are fantastic, um, and devising the set of papers for two years ahead. We work within a kind of two year window of setting. Um, when CE presented me with the opportunity of creating a new specification, as Darrell said at the beginning, we had a number of consultations. Um, with prep school and secondary school teachers to ask you, what did you want from a kind of new look English CE? And the following points came primarily to the fore, strongly to the fore. Um, first of all, you thought that um, common entrance as it currently is, um, tested the same skills twice in English, first of all on the prose paper and then on the poetry paper, so it essentially doubles up. Um, you wanted more differentiation between level one and level two. Every year we receive feedback that the text choice for level one is perhaps a little too tricky um, and that we need to choose different texts for both levels and to make the distinction between the two much more clearly marked. So that was something that I took on board. You wanted to see some drama in there, as well as poetry and prose. Um, and in response, perhaps this is the most contentious of the questions, um, in, the, uh, in the writing, in the section B, um, the general feeling, or the, uh, there was a strong feeling that actually the response to literature um, was less successful. And that's because candidates can come into that part of the assessment with very prepared responses that give the marker, at least the secondary school, it's, it's very difficult to get a sense of what the pupil, the child is like by reading that response. Um, so somehow 
those responses to literature weren't quite working and we needed to think of another way of approaching that. I hope that the reading certificate might go some way towards that. Um, lastly, secondary schools in particular were keen and they feel that um, pupils in year seven and eight are very much capable of doing this. Um, we'd like to see a more cohesive response to literature. So rather than a set of questions which requires pupils to look at details in isolation, we'd like to see pupils synthesize that understanding um, throughout the assessment um, more coherently and in fact bring that kind of culmination of understanding together in a mini critical essay at the end. And we've done that in section C, as I'll illustrate in a moment. So my next slide. Level one and level two, well, they no longer exist, um, but we have created a foundation paper. Um, we expect that most pupils will choose to do the standard level reading paper. Um, but some pupils may choose at 13 plus to do the foundation paper. Um, and the foundation paper is, um, it's very stretching as well, but it's a little bit more scaffolded. Um, there's a different te text choice. Um, so the vocabulary perhaps is less stretching. It might be the best option for pupils who are approaching the assessment with English as additional language. Um, so they have the option, pupils have the option, you have the option of choosing whether your 13 plus students are going to do the standard level reading paper or the foundation reading paper. And we feel that the writing paper um, provides sufficient accessibility for pupils of both levels, of all levels, um, to demonstrate what they can do. Um, so two options there. You can either do the foundation paper and the writing paper or the standard level reading paper and the writing paper. And you'll notice from the small print that on the standard level, we now offer poetry, prose and drama. Whereas on the foundation level, the text choice will always be prose. Thank you. Next slide. I'm going to start with the writing paper because it's the same for all pupils and it's perhaps the easiest to describe. Um, so we've I've covered a little of this already, um, the foundation and the standard, and the fact that we want to give pupils opportunities to demonstrate their skills of writing in um, lots of different forms. Um, so there'll be questions on the paper which allow pupils to demonstrate what they can do in terms of narrative, descriptive, informative, discursive, persuasive, reflective, evaluative writing. Um, we want them to be able to play to their strengths and to have an opportunity to shine. Um, originally, taking the principle that less is more, we designed a paper where they choose just one question. But then in response to your feedback, um, we decided to open that up. So now pupils have the opportunity to answer on two prompts and they can do any two prompts on the paper. Um, and that means if one task perhaps doesn't go so well, um, they have the opportunity to shine on the second. Um, and we hope to, well, we, we, we are choosing a range of titles and prompts that we hope will encourage pupils or inspire them um, to make interesting choices, whoever they are. Next slide. These are the example questions from my um, specimen paper to illustrate the sorts of things that we might ask. And it's perfectly fine for people to choose um, two creative options, what might traditionally be called creative options. Um, you could write a story followed by a description of a garden or if you're more inclined towards um, non-fiction writing, um, you could write a report on a work experience placement or a visit to the workplace of a member of your family. And then you could write a speech to give to your school assembly. Or you can mix it up and do one creative task on the elephant in the room 
and then follow up with a speech to an assembly. It's a free choice, but pupils need to write on two prompts. Thank you. Okay, um, if you've been keeping track online of the new specification as it's evolved in response to feedback, um, you'll see that uh, both responses are now marked out of 25. That means that the whole paper is worth 50. And in fact, the reading paper or the foundation paper is also marked out of 50. So it's 50% for writing, 50% for reading overall. And within that, um, I've developed a, a mark scheme that gives a percentage of marks for ideas, structure, form and voice, the macro elements of the writing response, and then um, another mark for spelling, punctuation and expression, the clarity of that communication at the micro level. Thank you. It's very small text here, but um, if you you can have a little peer and see at the criteria for ideas, structure, form, and voice. Um, essentially, the question will be marked, or each question will be marked in bands, and the criteria for each band um, takes a certain pattern, and you might be able to see that by looking closely. So first of all, how well does the candidate respond to the prompts? How precisely do they address the task? Have they chosen the correct form for this piece of writing or an appropriate form for this piece of writing? Um, does the, the, has it been planned? Does this writing have real sense of direction and purpose? And does the pupil achieve that purpose in some detail? Is it structured well? Has the pupil thought about the structure of this piece? Is it deliberate and well-crafted? Um, and finally, have they chosen an appropriate voice or register? So if it's a speech for a school assembly, um, maybe it's slightly different than a, um, an email to your, to your mum. Very good, next. Not that I choose that for a question, but. Next question. Spelling and punctuation. Again, you'll see that there are patterns to the criteria. So we've got spelling, we've got punctuation, we've got using a variety of sentence structures, um, using expression and vocabulary so that it's not overwritten, but yet it's it's nuanced and enhanced, can use making a good choice of words so that they're precisely and deliberately chosen, effectively chosen. Um, and also, I think this is really important, being able to manage the use of tense so that um, in a piece of creative writing, for example, if a pupil chooses to write in the past tense, can they sustain that all the way through? Or do they find themselves flipping between the present and the past tense without good rationale? And it has to be a really good rationale to slip between tenses. So a really strong command of tense, grammatical tense. Next, next slide. Okay, the reading papers then, moving from writing into reading. Um, what do we want to achieve? What do we want to test on these papers or give pupils an opportunity to demonstrate that they can do? Well, we want them to be able to demonstrate a full range of reading skills, obviously. That's literal understanding and information selection, which is so important. Close attention to detail. Um, and within that, an understanding of what language denotes. So what does this mean? It all goes together, those three, I think. The literal, what, what words mean. Then taking those meanings and applying them in context. Um, so if you're using a word like red, um, if it means the colour red, what does it mean in terms of a traffic light? Suddenly it takes on the connotation of danger or stop, don't go there. Um, we're moving now into the territory of what language connotes. So we've worked out what it denotes, the colour, we're working out what it connotes. And as soon as you start going to that area, looking at inferring meaning, 
um, looking at the effects of imagery, and also looking at how form can impact on meaning and effect, particularly perhaps in poetry, but also in prose and drama as well. Essentially, I'm really keen that pupils in year seven and eight should develop an evidence-based approach so that they can back up their ideas and their responses by going back to the text and saying, yes, it's this image that gives me this idea. It's this detail or this combination of details that combine to give this effect. So both evidence-based and synthesized, drawing ideas together across the text to come to an evaluative response. Um, and finally, using their understanding to structure a clear critical argument. And essentially, as I designed the papers, um, I've designed them so that those skills build during each paper. Um, we'll look at that a little bit more closely in a moment. But whereas the first questions might require candidates to discern literal meanings, what words and phrases denote, they'll build in the second section to start exploring what those words and phrases might connote in context. And then finally, in section C, I'm asking pupils to draw all that together and to give me one final either creative or evaluative response. Next slide. So what are the differences between the foundation paper and the reading paper one, the standard level reading paper? Um, well, there are different text choices. The foundation paper will always be a prose text. Um, it might be from literary fiction or it might be from literary nonfiction. Um, whereas the text choice on the reading paper, the standard level reading paper, it could be prose, it could be drama, it could be poetry. And we hope to mix that up into, in such a way that um, perhaps it's not, you, you can't kind of work it out in advance. So although for the first year, um, it'll be, we'll, we will produce a kind of prose, poetry and drama, from there on we might mix it up a little bit so that um, although there are plenty of practice papers to work with in all forms, um, it's not easily predictable which one's going to come up in June. Um, on the foundation paper, more words will be glossed and we're certainly working quite hard to make sure that the vocabulary is more accessible on the foundation paper. Um, you'll also find on the foundation paper that in section B, in the middle section of the paper, the questions are more clearly scaffolded. So, for example, we might break a question into two ask candidates to find a couple of quotations first to illustrate a certain idea and then in the next half of the question ask them to explain how they illustrate that idea um, i think you may recognize that format from the level one level two questions um, that are still current at the moment thank you next slide Okay, so those are the differences between the foundation um, and, the, and, the, and the standard level reading paper, um, or at least an introduction to those differences. However, the principles that underpin both papers are the same. Um, we want to give candidates a helping hand to access the deeper meanings, to access the most synthesized, deep response to the text that they can. Um, and for this reason, we've broken the, tech, the, the papers into three parts. The first part, section A, is a multiple choice and or short answer um, section. And there'll be eight questions. Um, and within those questions, um, one, of, one of which is a one marker, other which, otherwise they're two marks, there'll either be multiple choice or perhaps they'll be asked to um, rewrite a phrase um, that's written in, in, in direct speech, which isn't quite grammatically correct, so that the grammar is corrected. Um, if you look at my specification specimen papers online, you'll be able to see an example of that in the um, specimen foundation paper. Um, so those multiple choice questions are designed to guide candidates through the text 
and to draw their attention to features of it that they might otherwise slip over or that perhaps might cause a misconception and to encourage them to address that misconception at this early stage so that they can then go on and develop a better response, a deeper response in section B and section C when the questions are broader and start to get a little bit more difficult. So section B is very similar to the current um, uh, section A questions. Um, questions which ask for information selection, analysis of language, um, understanding of character, um, that sort of thing, with a broken down a little bit for the, for the candidate. So multiple choices a step up into section B. And then section B is a step up into section C, where I ask candidates to draw their understanding of the whole text together and to um, structure a little essay. We give them some bullet points suggesting what they might put in each paragraph, um, addressing a question about the text. Next slide. I've been jumping ahead of myself with my slides here, um, but here's a little bit more information about the multiple choice questions. Just give you a, a moment to have a look at that. If you can see the text on the slide, quite small. Okay, and then the next slide. And again, I'll just give you a, a moment to have a read of that. So hopefully that will illustrate that the multiple choice questions are really there to guide pupils through the text, to draw their attention to details that they might perhaps stumble over, um, to make sure that they've read closely and they can apply that understanding in section B with some slightly longer answer questions. Um, but of course, the new piece of the puzzle is section C. And for that, I need a new slide. Okay, section C differs a little for the foundation paper and for the standard level reading paper. Um, on the foundation paper, it will be an exercise in directed writing. Um, so, for example, um, the question might ask the candidate to rewrite the events of the text, but from a different character's point of view. And in order to do that, the pupil will have to have picked up lots of key details about the happenings of the text, understand character, the relationships between character, and then reorganize that information um, so that they can represent it from the alternative point of view. So it is a test of reading and reading closely and of deep understanding. Yes, it allows some creative input, as I would argue any writing task does, including writing a critical essay, more of that in a moment. Um, but essentially, we're testing how well the candidate has read and understood that text, because only if they've read and understood it deeply can they then reorganise it effectively from another character's point of view. So that's the foundation level. Incidentally, we think that the foundation level papers might be um, nice teaching materials for years six and year seven, um, if you don't intend to use them with your year 13s. Um, sorry, not year 13s, your, your 13 plus, your year 8s um, for that transitional exam. Okay, so section C on the standard level reading paper, what does that um, involve? Um, well, actually, I'm sorry, the first point there should be underneath the foundation um, paper, um, the new perspective on the whole text. Um, 
Oh, sorry, no, I'm stumbling over my own slides here. Um, essentially, they would have had this question in either section A or section B. It'll give a slightly different perspective on the text than that which has come up in the questions so far. Um, so it's a new question, a new way of looking at the text that perhaps the questions haven't, haven't directly prepared them for so far. They're going to have to, again, reorganize their knowledge and their understanding of the text in order to respond to it. However, this time, instead of taking a creative approach, which also demands deep reading, um, I'm asking them to write a mini critical essay. And essentially, this means developing three paragraphs of argument in response to the question on the point, explanation, evidence analysis model. So making three points of argument in response to the question, explaining those points of argument, maybe breaking them down in order to explain them, and each time supporting those explanations with evidence from the text and some analysis of that evidence. So perhaps going into the, the words and the phrases, the language and the structure of the text and explaining how that language and structure brings the point to life, makes it, makes it live within the text. Thank you, next slide. Okay, so I presented you so far with the principles behind our creation of the new specification in English. And I've also walked you through what the new assessment materials look like in reading and writing foundation and standard level. Um, but the, the $50 million question, what does this mean for teaching? And for this, I need my next slide. Well, the ideal is that um, our assessment materials are only used for summative assessment at the end of a year or perhaps sometimes at the end of a term to punctuate um, a much more sustained and cohesive study of whole texts. Um, we certainly wouldn't want any school to teach English through assessment paper after assessment paper from year five or six onwards. Um, they really should be the candle on the cake and the cake which is the best bit, which is much more delicious than the candle, is the study of literature and non-fiction. Um, the enjoyment of, of, of reading and of expressing yourself through talk and through writing um, and that's what needs to be at the heart of the classroom. That's the engine of the whole process um, in key stage three, at the end of key stage two. Um, so the assessment structure, it supports a scaffolded development of skills, as I've introduced to you. So first of all, you've got that kind of literal or understanding of literal meanings, what words denote, information selection, building up to looking at meanings in context, and from that, inferring meanings, looking at imagery, um, and uh, yeah, drawing everything together in a synthesized response. Um, I'm just going to pop my chat box down there. We're really keen that it shouldn't all be about pupils reading and writing in isolation, that this will provide a stimulus um, for lots of talk and discussion and collaboration. Um, in fact, maybe some pupils might even work on a, a reading certificate project together, for example, and they should certainly share them with each other. Um, emphasis on enjoyment if pupils aren't enjoying English, they won't learn as much as they would otherwise. And essentially, enjoyment should be at the, at the heart of everything at school for children. So really enjoying it, um, but also rigor. This evidence-based approach, looking for evidence to support their points and ideas. Um, as well as developing an instinctual response, but being able, then being able to go back to the text and to support it with evidence. And I think that that's the end of my presentation. Can I just have a look at the next slide and double check? It is indeed.
Very good. So, and now I hand over to you. I hope that that was clear and informative, but if you have any questions, please do pop them in the chat and I will answer them for you. Thank you so much, Abby. That was absolutely brilliant. And hopefully everybody's beginning to get a really great picture of what is happening uh, with the new specifications and how you might integrate that into what you're doing in school. Um, now, I've got some questions that came in. We did solicit questions um, on Eventbrite beforehand. And so I've got about three or four, Abby, that I will ask you in a second if that's OK. Firstly, though, just a little bit of extra information and housekeeping for those of you that are watching YouTube on full screen. So I've got mine up here on full screen to check everything's fine. If you minimize that, you can see that you can chat. And for those of you that would like to ask Abby any questions at all or ask ISEB any questions, do put those into the chat. Just a quick note that you will need to sign in to YouTube before it will allow you to do that. But I've just got another slide now um, to talk about some of our resources and books that should give you guys time if you need to, to log in. So one of the things that you may well notice um, is that Galore Park produces resources, um, books, uh, question papers, past papers, um, and you've got question and answer textbooks as well. And what you can see on the screen are those that will be released this summer. So these are being released really shortly. I believe geography is coming first with the others very, very shortly afterwards. And if you would like to get hold of those new textbooks, you can go straight to the Galore Park website where they will be. They're endorsed by ISCB. Or there's an email here at the bottom, Candice Thurston, if you wanted to contact Candice about wider sets of books for your schools. Um, for those of you, you don't need to bother taking down Candice's address at the moment. Everybody will get a PDF copy of these slides. And again, where we put up some of the details from the specification, the new English specification is available on the ISEB website, but these PDF slides will allow you to have a browse through at your leisure. The last thing also to say is that if you have colleagues that weren't able to see this or there were bits that you wanted to go over again, the YouTube stream will come up on our YouTube channel. You don't need to be a subscriber under videos and you can watch that at any time. So, Abby, I think our first question was around teaching and um, one of the teachers had asked us, what sort of adjustments do you recommend making to schemes of work um, in light of the new specifications, is there a worry for teachers about suddenly swapping things over or have you got any recommendations? So I suppose um, in, in terms of the final assessment, it would be important to introduce those skills of structuring a kind of mini essay in response to a, a, a whole text question, um, uh, which, is, which is the new part of the assessment. Um, that doesn't mean that it has to be um, a, an incredibly lengthy or challenging task, but what we're trying to encourage students to do is to come up with three separate points and to be able to develop them, prioritise and to develop them um, so that they have the foundations of essay writing structure um, before they come into year nine at senior school. And that will just give them a step up um, so for when they start to approach um, GCSE. Um, so that would be the main change, the main introduction. Beyond that, just to re-emphasize that I, I hope that schools will continue to teach whole texts, um, you know, a, a, a new text every every term or half term, um, connections of poetry, um, rather than simply teaching through assessment materials, and then use the assessment materials simply as um, a, a summative assessment, um, a, a bit of a game at the end of the, the process. Um, lots of talk as well, lots of discussion, lots of talk, using, using oracy as a, as a route to good writing. Thank you, Abby. That's a great answer. As a former English teacher myself, I'm I'm loving all of this. <laughs> so um, the next question that had come in before the session was um, somebody had asked, 
Will there be changes to the English case papers, our common academic scholarship examinations? I hope so, down the line, but not at the moment. Um, um, we've been focusing for the last couple of years, and it's, it's been a two-year process on re redevising the 13 months. That process is still happening. I mean, it's, yeah. we've come up with a new specification, but I know that um, you will have feedback and we're still listening to feedback and adapting and tweaking um, as you give us your ideas and your comments. So thank you. Thanks, Abby. And yes, actually, I can concur that although I'm very new to ISCB, um, one of the things we are really exploring is what we can do with CASE, how we can support schools with CASE and breathe some additional excitement just like we have into CE into those specifications. Now we had another one and in fact Freya from the uh, chat here has given us a question that was the same as one that came before which is around set texts. So will we release suggested texts? Do we release book lists to help guide pupils for reading certificates? Um, the short answer is no. Um, but the longer answer, I suppose, is why. Um, I think that they can be restrictive. I think that there are wonderful text choices out there that suit pupils of different abilities and different personalities and who enjoy different sorts of writing. Um, and that the best thing to do really is to create a community of, of teachers who share great text choices, and that's much more powerful than uh, an exam board producing a list, which can become a bit restrictive in that pupils feel that they have to read every text on that list, even if perhaps they're not ready for it yet, or it might not be the one that you, in your professional judgment, would choose. Um, so I need to contribute kind of anonymously behind the scenes to a, a list of, of text choices that you as a community of teachers might make, but I don't want to produce a kind of ISCB set list. Thank you, Abby. That makes perfect sense. I can I can definitely understand why that's something that we don't do. Um, I've got a question actually that leads on about the reading certificates in that I'd had questions from teachers about your recommendation. Do you recommend adding the reading certificate as part of normal CE practice? Um, they don't yet do it, are considering doing it, but would like a little bit of further detail and justification to build that into what they're doing. I'd love for pupils to present their reading certificate as part of their um, common exit portfolio, common entrance portfolio to their new school. Um, to be able to say, you know, these are my reading and writing papers, but look, this is all the lovely reading that I've been doing on the side. And this is my imaginative response to the text that I've been reading. Um, I think that would be a real celebration of the reading that pupils have done in year seven and eight. Um, but it's probably quite um, an extensive thing to organize. It depends on how things function in your school. So at the moment, it's not it's not compulsory. It's uh, simply, I hope, a lovely suggestion. But certainly as um, uh, when I was, I know that my English department at Westminster would, would love it if pupils were to come from our feeder schools and say, look, these are the things that we've been reading and this is how we've responded to them. Excellent. Um, another question that had come in previously was around CE English specifically and how you feel that addresses a milestone to GCSE. Now, I remember you mentioning this earlier in your presentation, but um, I had a question about it specifically is do you feel that by introducing CE English to a school's repertoire, that they're helping with that milestone to other public examinations later on? Yes, I think so. Um, but then on the other hand, I'm very aware that students at the age of 13 have got three years to go before they get to GCSE. So I'm very conscious of the fact that I'm not seeking to unnaturally accelerate or preempt um, 
the, the student stage of development, that this is a gradual process and that we need to kind of enjoy that gradual development rather than seeking to unnaturally accelerate it. Um, I do think that the skills that I've been tried to invest in these um, assessment materials and the specification, they set really, really strong, good groundwork for literary study at GCSE, A level, university, whatever. I think you know all the groundwork is there. Brilliant. And actually, so this is a, a call out to everybody in the audience. Do post um, some questions in the chat. I've got one more that had come in um, from the audience before our session started, which is, is there an ideal balance between reading, writing and speaking when teaching this specification? Oh, gosh, that's an interesting question. Hmm. <laughs> I think you need to be reading all the time. The, the, the ideal is, and it's a challenge, um, you know, in this day and age when students have so many pulls and very attractive pulls on their time, especially on their unstructured time, the challenge is that they will elect to go and read a good book rather than, I don't know, go and play Minecraft or Roblox or whatever. Um, so I think the challenge is to keep that sustained reading practice going all the time and to celebrate it and to encourage it. So reading needs to be 100%. Talking needs to be, well, high on the agenda as well, because it's through articulating our ideas in speech that we start to organise them and to get a sense of our own voice, which we can then articulate in writing. Um, but obviously you need to think before you speak. So if we're reading all the time, reading books, reading people, reading situations, listening, listening is a form of reading, um, then responding through talk and finally responding through writing. I'm not sure that's the question, but. No, I think it was great. I love the idea that listening is a form of reading. That's excellent. So I've got another brilliant question actually from the floor uh, from Marmaduke, which is, are pupils on the autism spectrum better served by the foundation level paper? Gosh, that's a really good question. And um, yes, I, I can see where it's coming from, the sense that how are we addressing accessibility through our papers? Um, the, the foundation paper, um, it's certainly in terms of um, uh, pupils who may need support with um, working memory, um, maybe in terms of their kind of language acquisition, the level of language, language acquisition at which they're at, um, you know, uh, in terms of text difficulty, that sort of thing, our accessibility to check that the text and the questions are more accessible. Um, in terms of autism and um, whether you need to be able to infer deeply, understand, you know, be able to read emotions and feelings, that kind of thing. Um, I would argue that both texts demand some inference and some understanding of um, meanings that are not literal at least being able to get from the denoted meanings to the connoted meanings and to understand how character is created through a synthesis through a combination of detail um, and that's part of a student's kind of literary development in terms of their reading skills and again i'm not sure whether that answers your question um, but I would argue that the foundation paper is prose, whereas in the past, I know that um, some centres have questioned whether our use of poetry on the 13 plus paper has been equally accessible to pupils with autism, because often poetry demands more reading between the lines and kind of emotional, um, uh, emotional kind of deconstruction of the text. Thanks, Abby. I think I, I think the wider accessibility of all our papers at ISEB is something that we're making a real priority. So thanks loads for putting that question in, actually, because it means that we can start to 
ensure that we're communicating really clearly to schools and teachers how the specifications can support and how we as an example can do that too. Um, so I've had some more, she says looking up here. Um, I've had a brilliant question, another one from Freya. Will the specification have information about the grammar points that might be specifically tested? Um, or should we just be looking to the national curriculum? Quite straightforward, I think. I certainly wouldn't be expecting pupils to identify adverbial phrases um, or noun phrases or, um, you know, I wouldn't be looking for kind of technical passing of a sentence or anything like that. Verbs, nouns, adjectives, um, being able to use the correct punctuation in a sentence or at the end of a sentence, um, being able to punctuate direct speech, um, really straightforward sentence punctuation, being able to understand and appreciate um, sentence punctuation. So subject verb combination, keeping the tense consistent, that sort of thing. Brilliant, thank you, Abby. Um, the next one is from Mrs. Manton and actually backed up again by Freya. Um, I'd love suggestions for drama texts, not wanting to step on the toes of secondary schools. And Freya agrees, she says she agrees with Mrs. Manton that some suggested text to explore might help widen our repertoire, especially regarding drama, nonfiction, texts from other cultures, just without encroaching on senior curricula. Absolutely. I mean, again, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to sort of give a, a list of set texts, but what I would say is that um, dramatised novels um, or kind of you know, uh, scripts of scripts that have been created of novels, um, even scripts of uh, films or television um, shows uh, doesn't necessarily have to be uh, an original play script. It can be a script that adapts um, a text of a different form. Um, and in fact, we found that that's a really fruitful way of exploring dramatic effect, how, how a text translates into the dramatic medium and what the differences are. Um, so please don't feel restricted by having to use drama texts that were originally written as plays. It's perfectly possible and indeed I think quite fun to explore play scripts that have been created from novels etc radio scripts as well oh no thank you that's really helpful and I think definitely given your comments here Abigail and I will talk after this and explore how we can make sure we're supporting schools in the way that you need but also to ensure that we keep that really brilliant integrity that we have in the um, in the curriculum. There was a brilliant one from Katie Shuttleworth. Will the reading certificate be available for years five and six too? How do we apply? And do they receive the certificate at the end of year eight? Oh, that's a lovely question. Um, I think, please do take the pro forma for the reading certificate and, um, and, and use it as you as you would like within your schools. Um, I would love if we could have a kind of um, ISCB ratification of the reading certificate um, at the end of year eight that could be formally passed on to the secondary school. Um, at the moment, because it's, it's, it's voluntary, um, it will be up to you if you're prep school teachers to sort of say, and here are their reading certificates. Um, and so pupils can come to their new school and use that as a conversation starter with their form teachers, housemasters, um, English teachers. Um, but it would be really lovely to be able to formalise that in some way. Hopefully, if enough of you adopt it and like it, we can do that. Thanks, Abby. Actually, to support that, um, it'd be lovely to hear from you all. If you want to, our, our main email address at ISCB is inquiries at ISCB.co.uk, but we would absolutely explore certificating, ratifying the reading certificate and introducing that in the lower years if that's something that you want to do. So I would really support that. I think it's a wonderful idea. 
Um, we do have another question, but I just wanted to take one um, from Stephen Winchester, who just says he, he agrees that some suggestions not already used by year nine upwards would be really helpful. So, Abby, um, I think that's one for us to talk about afterwards. And, and everybody that's on this session today, we will make sure we let you know and start to explore what resources would be helpful for you. There was another question that I just emailed, actually, uh, which is, are there any ways we could integrate English in the study of poetry, drama, and prose into the IPQ? That's our um, ISCB project qualification, where students undertake a research um, question and a research inquiry all of their own. Do you think English lends itself to that and, and the CE specification could be supported by it, Abby? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I um, have... Uh, the pleasure well, I have had the pleasure of mentoring pupils through the HPQ, which is the higher project qualification, and the EPQ um, in my time. And certainly, pupils have taken a kind of literary um, approach to those. Um, for example, uh, we've often um, sometimes pupils take uh, two texts written at approximately the same time, but perhaps. Um, in two, in, from a different language. Um, so um, you could take a, a look at a, a French novel alongside um, an English novel or a French poet alongside an English poet. And especially if you have pupils who are coming from dual heritage backgrounds, it can be really lovely to take two kind of seminal texts from your background or interesting texts from your background and to explore how they approach a similar topic. And then that opens up um, a whole issue of different cultural perspectives and identity, um, which can be a lovely way in. So that's one example. But I think um, I, my understanding is that the IPQ lends itself to cross-disciplinary application. So wherever you can think of ways that literature um, or writing kind of join up with other subjects, um, perhaps looking at um, the presentation of uh, climate change or nature in poetry and looking at the implications of that alongside geography. I don't know, but there's lots of potential to use English there. No, I agree. I think there are loads of interesting things that can be done with drama, particularly, and, you know, with integrating cross-curricular activity and seeing how English and drama and poetry could be linked. I think it would be wonderful. Um, I have no more questions from the floor, but I shall give you guys out there a few more minutes if there are any that you would like. We've just had um, another suggestion, however, from Mrs. Manton, just to say, could we also consider moderated responses, especially for the new section C? They'd be really useful to help Mark in the early stages. And she says, thank you for the drama ideas. <laughs> so um, with no more questions from the floor, it's just to remind everybody that this recording will be available even with the uh, delivery drive from my dogs going mad. I think we'll be on that too, so I'm very sorry for that. Um, there will be a PDF made available to you of Abigail's slides. Um, and if you have any further questions, do get back to me um, on inquiries at iscb.co.uk and either myself or one of the team will get straight back to you. Um, these videos will also be made available with some additional content coming on the ISCB website, just with some feedback asking all of you what you think about additional resources and support for any of our CE subjects. And those questionnaires will be shared with us and our publisher. So if you have any burning requests for books and resources, either send them to inquiries at iscb.co.uk so I can share those or take a look at our website. We will email you all to let you know when new things go up there. And as I say, for any of you with colleagues who wanted to know where to find it, just go to our YouTube channel and click on videos and this session will be there. So without any further ado, thank you so much to Freya. She's thanked both of us, Abby, which is lovely for the session, but most importantly, thank you to Abigail. She's put in a huge amount of work, leads our setting team brilliantly and has created a really exciting English specification. Thank you so much for tonight, Abby. It's been absolutely brilliant, really informative. And to all of you who have tuned in, we really appreciate it. And we hope to see you again soon.
Thank you very much. <laughs>